My parents have this jewelry store they go to to get their watches, clocks, jewelry fixed, and it's owned by a really nice couple. I remember this one time in particular that I had to go to the store to drop something off. At that time, my grandmother was sick in the hospital, not doing well at all. I was in a big rush, having a bad day. And I go there to drop this off, and I just must, must have mentioned something about my grandmother being sick. And the lady who owns the store began to share with me how difficult it was for her when her mother passed away. Me not thinking much of it, I turned and went to leave and literally as my back was to the lady and my, I was about to walk out the front door, I stopped and thought, you know what, I could take just a few seconds to pray for this lady out of my busy day and I probably wasn't even that busy anyways. And so I turned around and asked her if it would be alright if I could pray with her. She said yes, she stuck her hands over the counter, I held both of her hands and I began to pray with her. As I prayed, it couldn't have been more than 30 seconds. And as I finished, I stopped and I looked up and I saw tears streaming down her face. The cool thing about this story is that still, years later, whenever one of my parents walk into her store, she goes on and on about how great of a kid Jonathan is, how nice I am, how much I care. And I think, why would she say those things about me? She hardly knows me. But it's all because of one moment. When I stopped out of my busy day and listened to God, just to show her how much I care and how much God loves her and it truly impacted her life for years later. church. Good morning, Henrietta campus. We have uh, the membership experience happening right now in Lima and right after this service in Henrietta. You're going to have a chance to be able to do that. And so we're so glad that you're tuning in. We want to welcome our friends watching online. And we are in week one of Love Does. Just tell your neighbor, Love Does. Look at your neighbor, Love Does. One of the coolest things that I get to do during my week is I get to spend time with some of the Elam Bible Institute students And I actually teach the public speaking and preaching class, a class that I used to be terrified to take. Now somehow God has me teaching it. Um, And it's, it's quite intimidating when you know you have students grading you constantly week in and week out on what you're teaching them. But one of the things that I talk about, about expressive communication, is this kind of scary fact. Some really smart people at like MIT or Stanford created these percentages on communication. And this is what they found. 7% of communication is verbal. In other words, only 7% of communication is what you hear someone say. It's verbal, which which is kind of scary because you'll remember less about what I say and more about how I say it. 7% of communication is verbal. 38% is paraverbal or how I say it. That's the the pitch, the pace, pause, all, all that. 38% is paraverbal, and 55% is body language or expression. 55%. You'll remember less about what I say and more about how I say it. And to illustrate this, uh, the the political debates right now have been kind of like a hot uh, item in the news lately, other than the Pope being in America. It's kind of one of the biggest things, these political debates. And uh, just prior to the first televised political debate, 1960, Vice President Richard Nixon was going up against Senator John F. Kennedy, and just before the debate, Richard Nixon banged his knee and injured it severely. So during the debate, he was favoring his knee to one side. You can almost see him leaning a little bit in that picture, but he was favoring his knee to one side throughout the whole televised debate. So at the end of the debate, they they polled those who were in the viewing audience, And they said that John F. Kennedy won the debate by a landslide. Then they polled those who were just listening to the debate by radio, and they said that Nixon won the debate by a landslide. Because of what he said to the people on the radio, they said, oh, he won it by a landslide. But the the expression was limping along, and there was something in his posture that everybody that watched it said, no, Kennedy took the debate. My point is that you can't communicate effectively without a full expression. And I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. 
1 John chapter 4, and I know we've got technological devices, and, and I'm all for that, but if you, if you need a Bible, we've got Bibles at both campuses. Feel free just to grab one. Uh, there's something about turning through a Bible just so you still remember where to find things, right? <laughs> and so we're going to put the verses on the screen, but I just want to encourage you, bring, bring your Bible to church. There's something about just knowing where to dig in. John is going to talk to us about this issue that real love has to be expressed, Real love requires full expression. And John is writing this letter to, to combat and to oppose some heretics. What's, what's a heretic? Uh, heresy is a false teaching about God that can deceptively move you away from God when you're trying to get to God. And the apostle John, the, the beloved disciple of Jesus, was combating some heretics. Some of them were known as the docetists, and they believed that Jesus did not actually die, and therefore he did not actually rise from the dead. And then he was combating some Gnostics, and these, these people were the people that said, uh, basically, the Jesus that was on the earth, that the apostles were around, and that the Romans crucified, um, it really was an illusion, because everything in the material world is evil and everything in the spiritual world is, is, is holy or good. And so basically they said Jesus was kind of like a phantom. He was like an illusion. He didn't really die and he didn't really get resurrected. And of course John is saying, you know, hold the phone. We saw him, we beheld him, we touched him. And oh, by the way, even though he rose from the dead and is now ascended into heaven and is for all intents and purposes invisible to people... He is still being beheld and seen and touched through his body, which is you and I. And so John's going to tell us how to live out the full expression and actually bring proof of God's existence. So 1 John chapter 4, he says this in verse 7. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, let me just say this. Love does not define God. God defines love. Because some people will say, well, if God is love, then love is God. But it doesn't really work that way. Wherever God is, there is love. But not wherever there is love happening is there God. Does that make sense? Okay, so God defines love. Verse 9. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. By doing something for us, he was saying something to us. Verse 10, this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loves, uh, loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. This is, this is really interesting because John is saying, listen, I understand that we worship and we serve an invisible God. I've never had Jesus come to me in bodily form. I know that he appears to people in dreams, and I know that people have seen and, and met God, but, but John's saying basically... For, for the most part of your life, God is invisible, but he's not really invisible because as we love one another, God becomes visible. And so I want to show you two things this morning. Number one, God's love is infinitely valuable. He says in verse 9 and 10, God showed us how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love, not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. I want you to recognize that Jesus' death was not an accident, it was an appointment. God the Father was saying, this is what love looks like, this is what my love looks like. And uh, this past week, we, we lost a, a real hero in the baseball world, Yogi Berra, passed away at 90 years old, and, and I love baseball, so I'm finding a way to work Yogi into the message here. This is Yogi, and uh, he, he was a 15-time All-Star, 10-time World Series champion, three-time MVP, and he's the most quoted uh, person in sports history, Yogi-isms. He, he has all these isms. He was the guy that said, when you come to the fork in the road, take it. <laughs> and it ain't over until it's over. That's, that's Yogi Berra, and Yogi Berra said this, he said, love is the most important thing in the world. And then he said, but baseball's pretty good too. 
<laughs> Real love requires demonstration. We didn't just need a definition of love from God. We needed a demonstration of love. That's why Romans 5 says, but God demonstrated his love for us while we were at our worst he gave us his best. While we were, what, sinners, Christ died for us. So love, it requires a demonstration. Why? Because sometimes you can't just say it, you have to show it, right? How many of you, you've gone through the, the, the struggle where you're at a, a store trying to buy a card for your wife or someone, and you're, and you're looking through like a million cards, you're thinking, this should not take this long. But you can't quite find something that says it the way you want to say it. Sometimes you can't just say it, you've got to show it. Right? That's why my favorite quote was Benjamin Franklin. Well done is better than well said. Sometimes you can't just say it. God had to demonstrate his love. He had to show us his love. Dr. G. Campbell Morgan was probably one of the greatest preachers in, in history. And this British preacher had five sons. All five of his sons joined the ministry and became preachers. One guest came over for dinner one night and had the audacity to ask the question, just throws it out there during the meal, so who's the greatest preacher in the family? Without even blinking, all six of them yelled, mother. <laughs> now the woman had literally never preached an official sermon in her whole life, but how many of you know the goal is not a sermon well preached, but a life well lived? Love, listen, I don't want to just learn how to talk a good game. I want to live an expressive life, right? And so love requires demonstration. When love is a theory, it's safe. It doesn't, call, it doesn't you have to risk nothing when love is a theory. When love is just an idea trapped in the forehead of your mind, it, it doesn't risk anything. Love, love that's in the brain does not change the world. I had a conversation with a good friend, James Harrington. He's the director of the Ugandan Water Project. And sometimes when you're just around people that love people well, they just provoke you. They just challenge you. And he said this. He said, Josh, isn't it interesting that Jesus never told us to care about the poor? He said to care for the poor. How many of you know if I say, well, I care about someone, I can be passive. But to care for someone takes initiative. It takes action. And many times, I won't even care about someone until I care for them. A lot of times, we wait for the feelings, and we want something to, you know, get this train started. But when I start caring for someone, then I begin to actually care about them. You with me? Love can't be stationary. It's not a theory. It's, it, it, it does stuff. Biblical love requires a demonstration. It moves beyond planning and plotting and into doing. And that's what this whole series is about, love does it. And God demonstrated for us by giving the life of his one and only son. God the Father was saying, listen, whatever the cost, demonstrate love. It took me the life of my own son to demonstrate love. Whatever the cost, demonstrate love. Now, for different people and in different circumstances, you've got to, it costs you different things to express love. Uh, we had a reality of that in our house just, just last night. Anna was saying to the boys, Daddy knows I love him when I make him his favorite chicken pot pie. And I thought, wow, that's awesome. You, you could say I love you by making me chicken pot pie. But uh, recently, or in a couple of weeks, Anna and I are getting ready to celebrate our 15th wedding anniversary. And uh, when, we, when we were first engaged and married, I gave her uh, a ring and, and did the whole official thing. And I never quite understood why women like diamonds so much. Um, I, and I've come to realize that it's not necessarily the diamond, it's the statement. It's the symbol. And a lot of times, it's the sacrifice to buy the symbol. Are you with me? Come on, come on, help me preach this. <laughs> and so, so, you know, I got her a really great diamond, but the issue was I kind of got a good deal on it because she really liked my mother's diamond, so I bought it off my mom, and my mom gave me kind of a wholesale price. I still had to work a lot, and I still had to pay that thing off, but it was, you know, and so we said, someday, one day, we're going to upgrade that thing, and, and I, you know, getting married, guys don't know about upgrading the ring. You think this is like a done deal, and this is it, but uh, coming up on the 15th, she said, I think it's a good year for us to upgrade my ring, you know, <laughs> and I thought, man, I was thinking 20 or 25 years, you know, and so we were just kind of playing around, and, and I realized, you know, to, say, to demonstrate love, sometimes it takes diamonds, sometimes it takes a chicken pot pie. So, uh, 
The point of the message is love requires a demonstration. You can't just say it. You've got to show it. God didn't just say it. He showed it through the life of his son. Number one, God's love is infinitely valuable. God said something to us by doing something for us. And then he didn't stop there because at the same time he was doing something inside of us. Number two, God's love through us becomes incredibly visible. Watch what it says in verse 11 again. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. The Bible teaches in Colossians chapter 1, Jesus said, or the writers inspired by the Holy Spirit said that Jesus is the expressed image of the invisible God. Jesus is the expressed image of the Father. And Jesus said this, you want to follow me? You get to do the same thing. You will be my expressed image in the earth while I'm gone. When they saw me, they saw the Father. And when they see you, they're going to see me. Jesus said, I want, I want you to do the same thing. Now, I was just thinking through this process of, of what it would take for the disciples to believe that this would actually work. I mean, can you imagine? Like, we're like a few billion people later in the process, so it's a little easier to say, like, yeah, the kingdom of God, this, this thing about making an invisible God visible through being his body on the earth, hands and feet. You know, we, we get it. It works. But can you imagine being some of the original disciples thinking, I'm not so sure once he leaves, this thing's going to work. You know, I just pictured in my mind, how many of you have ever seen the show Shark Tank? Just wave at me. Henrietta Campus, let me see. Shark Tank, you've at least heard of it or you may have seen it. We got a picture here, I think. Of some, yeah, there we go. And uh, I, I was just picturing, what if the 12 disciples came into Shark Tank together to sell their idea? You know, they said, hey, here, they, you know, they sit down and, and, and they say, okay, Mark Cuban says, okay, pitch your idea. What is it? So our founder and president is gone and uh, he's not coming back for quite a while. He's actually invisible right now uh, because he's in heaven. But uh, we believe because he told us that as we, you know, take care of each other and as we love people that they'll actually have an encounter with him and it's going to spread all over the world. And uh, this idea, it's called the, you know, kingdom of God. And, uh, you know, he told us it would work. Can you imagine some of the, the, the follow-up questions being fired at them? This is your brilliant business strategy? Your founder's gone, and just because you do loving things, you think people are going to meet him? Like, uh, what, like what are you, you know, the, the Mr. Wonderful, the, the guy grimacing in the middle, uh, they call him Mr. Wonderful. You know, one by one, the sharks would be like, I'm out, I'm out. This is not going to work. I'm out, I'm out. And then Mr. Wonderful would say something like, uh, this is never going to go beyond the 12 of you. You're dead to me. That's what they say. You're dead to me. I'm out. Well, I'm just trying to tell you that a few years later, the business model works. There are billions of satisfied customers in heaven. There are a couple billion satisfied customers on the earth, more than any other business in Facebook, Twitter. I don't care what you compile. Because we express love, an invisible God has new followers on the planet. How many are with me? Jesus said, when you do this, you are going to make me visible. It's actually better that I leave and that you guys do this. It's powerful. Our love for people makes the unseen God seen. The Bible says that Jesus, and some people don't know this, but it's true because it's in God's word. Jesus is the desire of the nations. Everyone, ultimately, he is the desire of the nations. And so our job is just to make the desired one visible. The desired one become visible. And I believe God wants it to become like a natural thing that we do. You've got to be, it's got to be intentional, but he wants it to be natural. And as much as I'm an optimist, in a few weeks' time, it's going to start getting cold around here. I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. When I take the kids out for the bus in the morning, it's going to be crisp and cold. And without even trying, my breath that was so conveniently invisible will become visible because it's going to get cold. And I don't have to try to make it visible. I just breathe and it happens. You with me? And I feel like God wants his love to just be so in us that it just comes out of us naturally. It's like, it's like breathing. It's, it, love without demonstration is really invisible. 
And it's quite powerful when you say it, but it's more powerful when you show it, right? And so Jesus is saying, listen, you're going to have my love in you, and there's going to be such a family resemblance that when people see you, they will see me. Uh, this past weekend, Anna and I, we drove down with our family to Connecticut, and uh, we were doing, I was doing a funeral for my grandmother, and my mom's whole side of the family are 100% Portuguese. So that's why you've heard me when I've referred to my grandmother, I say vovô, because that's what you call your grandma in a Portuguese family. So we were doing vovô's funeral, and the oddest thing, you know, th- there's family resemblance for sure in a lot of people, but my uncle Dominic looks just like his mother looked. And, and I, you know, we, we kind of teased him about it because I'm not sure how much you want to look like your, you know, aging mom. But my Uncle Donnie, it, like my sister came in the room and she's traveling from Florida to get up here and she walks into the living room and she's like, whoa, Vavo's on the couch. Like, I thought we were here for her funeral. Like, I mean, it's so striking, the family resemblance. It's like, uh, I know you're dead and I know you're not here anymore, but you're still here. <laughs> Jesus said the same thing. He said, listen, I'm going to die. I'm going to raise from the dead. I'm going to heaven, but I'm going to be incredibly visible all over the planet because you will resemble my love and you will... And he didn't say this. He didn't say, when people see you, they might think about me. He said, when people see you, they will encounter me. When people feel your love, they'll feel my love coming through you. That's That's how potent this thing is. And so... How do, we, how, do we practice, how do we practically do this? We're going to talk about this for a number of weeks, but I want to give a few helpful things. How do we practically walk this out? Um, here's some of the things I've been learning. And the book does a brilliant job talking about some of these things. Learning to be engaged. Engaged is not an event before a marriage. <laughs> engaged is a lifestyle. It's, it's a way of learning how to do life. Um, being engaged in the moment, being engaged with people. And what I have found is that it's very easy not to be engaged. Uh, I could be playing with my kids and all of a sudden I'm doing work at the office, but I'm actually home on my floor. Uh, I'm lying in their bed doing bedtime and they're talking to me about stuff and all of a sudden I'm like working on a message or I'm doing something, right? You've got to learn to be engaged. And, And I love what the great theologian Muhammad Ali said. He said that, because you got to learn how to do this. You can't just say, I'm going to be lovingly engaged my whole life, every second of every day. No, you got to learn how to do this. He said, no one can win every second of every round in a boxing match. No one. He said, all I do is I try to win the first round, the last round, and the last 15 seconds of every round in between. One of the greatest boxing champs of all time. He said, you can't win every second of every round. I want to win the first round, the last round, the last 15 seconds of every round in between. You notice in the video, John Bergio said, I had my back turned to the woman and I turned around. What was he doing? He was winning the last 15 seconds of that round. You're not going to win. You're not going to be fully engaged for every second of every day, every moment. But when the Holy Spirit just prompts you and and just perks, percolates love there, you, you want to you start your day in love, you want to end your day, and you want to you leave a deposit of God's love before you move to the next interaction with somebody. You with me? And, and, and you, we've got to learn to be engaged, and it takes practice. It takes asking Jesus, God, give me more grace to be in the moment. Learning to be engaged. How about this one? The book talks about deciding whether or not we are ushers or bouncers in the kingdom of God and when it comes to church family. Are we an usher or are we a bouncer? Bouncers just try to make sure that the wrong people don't get in. Ushers just try to help people find their way to a seat that someone else paid for. Come on, that's what we do in the kingdom of God. I've been to baseball games, hockey games, and when people don't sit in their nice expensive seats as a kid, I would try to get up and make my way down to the nice seats. And the guy who is, you know, checking people's tickets, if he's busy doing something, I'm sitting down and I'm, you know, in the box seat. And then the guy who is the usher can momentarily turn into the bouncer. You know, young man, where's your ticket? And then you realize we're busted. We need to go back up to the nosebleeds, you know, where you can see the little figures moving, you know, on the field and bust out your binoculars. But as in, in the kingdom of God and as a church, it's, Jesus, Jesus said, my followers don't need to be bouncers. You don't need to worry about who's getting in and who's not getting in. You just need to be ushers. You just need to be saying, you know what? Come on in. Let me help you find your seat. Somebody else paid for you to have a seat at this table. Amen? Ushers 
or bouncers. It's the great privilege. We simply get to be the ones that lead people to their seats that have already been paid for. Okay, here's another practical thing. And this is big for all of you competitive people. Learning to not always try to win at everything. You know, my kids came home the other day and they said, Dad, let's do a thumb war. I thought, wow, thumb wars are still around? <laughs> they won't go away. You know, they're, one, two, three, four, I declare a thumb war. And they're, you know, we're fighting and we're warring and all this stuff. And all of a sudden the sneak finger comes out and they're pulling all these moves, you know. And I thought to myself, you know what? We, you know, we may stop doing that at like third grade or whatever, but basically people live with like a thumb war mentality. While I'm driving, I'm going to beat you, even if we're rushing to a red light, right? We're in a conversation. I'm going to make sure you know that I've got the right answer. Even when you try to share your faith and you witness to people, it's like, stop trying to win, right? Just love people. I'm, I'm learning, you know, and I love competition. In fact, Henrietta Campus, Dan Frieda is the young adults pastor for us, and, and I pray that I beat you at fantasy football today. I might not, but I pray that I do, okay? I love competition, but you can't live life like it's a thumb war. I'm going to win this theological debate. I'm going to win this. I'm going to get this person to Christ. I'm going to win this argument. I'm going to, you got to just, you know what? Instead of winning, how about just try being loving? How about just saying, God, just help me to be humble, right? I don't need to win. Life was not meant to be a competi competition. The Bible says it was meant to be a demonstration. It wasn't meant to be a competition. So learning and, and the whole winning too, sometimes I used to think that it was my job to fix people. And now I realize that sometimes you just need to be with people. And just your presence, the love of God can just make a statement to people. You with me? Last practical thing here, it says, um, we've got to make the decision, am I going to be a reflection of someone or reaction to someone? Think about this right now. Is your life more a reflection of Jesus or a reaction to the people around you? That's a great question to ask yourself on a regular basis. I, want you, I know you want to be a reflection of the invisible God and make him visible. But the question is, are we living with a mentality of reflecting Jesus or reacting to people? My life can either be a reflection of or a reaction to, and I get to decide. And this is a part of the love does process. You know, I went, we had a retreat not that long ago, a few months ago in the spring with our staff, and then we had a retreat with our elders, and we were working on the mission statement of our church. We, I wanted it to be uh, simple and crisp and memorable, and um, I completely agreed in our previous mission statement theologically, and it was very robust and complete. But I just said, I want something more simple. I want something that we can live out. I want something that people will say, this isn't just EGC's statement. This is my statement. I want to do this with my life. And so I began to work with the elders and with the staff. And our previous mission statement was this, to help one another experience Christ's transforming love so that we can love him, ourselves, our families, our church, and our world. And I loved it. And, and I completely agree with it. But it was it was too complex, and there were two issues with it that I didn't really like. I didn't want us to somehow, over time, think that the one another of our mission statement was just us. I didn't want it to become insider-focused. And the fact that the love of God flowing through me, touching the world, was the last thing that we said. I wanted it to be a little more evangelistic. And so this is the new version that the elders and the staff and I came up with, and it's real simple. To experience the love of Jesus and give it away. That's it. You can't give what you don't have, right? God would never expect you. And so he says, listen, I've got this great love for you. And out of that account, just overflow for people. I want you to experience the love of Jesus and give it away. I want to experience the love of Jesus and give it away. This is what I pray all the time. Sunday morning, God, may you fill me up with your love and your truth. And may you just feed people. I want to experience your love and I want to give it away. And I want to keep it to myself. The kingdom is, it's got this paradox. Whatever I try to keep, you know, diminishes. Whatever I give away increases. I want to experience the love of Jesus and give it away. I want to take his valuable love and I want to make it visible. And I know you want to do the same thing. And, and so this is, this is where we wrap. This is the intro to the series. And here's, here's the thing that you received when you came in. At both of our campuses, you should have received the love does challenge. Because again, 
Love in the brain changes nothing. Love as a theory risks nothing. Love does some things. And so here's, here's the challenge. I'm challenging us to attend all five Sundays. You already got one down right there. Just pat yourself on the back. And if you're traveling out of town, you can tune in online. If you're sick at home, you can tune in online. But attend all five Sundays so you track with us on what we're doing as a church family. The second challenge is to attend a small group. And if you're a small group leader at either of our campuses, we've got this great DVD that will lead your discussions for the next five or six weeks. You can pick these up at Next Steps. They're free. The church wants to make an investment into your group. Uh, really well done. You're going to love Bob Goff, the author, talking through some of his story. And so, again, uh, if you didn't hop on the train two weeks ago at the group Sunday and our group's fair, then uh, you can do that. You just go to Next Steps. There's, there's groups for men, women, children, students. You name it. There are open groups waiting for you to join and to go through this, this together. So attend a small group. Here's the next one. Invite a friend to a weekend service or small group. Um, You may have noticed, but we've invited some of your friends and neighbors already. (laughs) We sent out a mailer to 10,000 homes in the Henrietta community and 5,000 homes in the Lima area. And so we've kind of already gone ahead of you and invited your neighbors. And so why don't you just respond to the Holy Spirit while you're at the grocery store, while you're talking to your neighbors, and just ask them to come with you and let's see what God does. For those that, that came because of the mailer, I just want to welcome you. You're our guest. We're so glad that you're here. It says, you know, come as you are. We don't expect you to clean yourself up before you get here. That's, that's God's job. He would love to, to have you experience his love. And so the challenge, invite someone. Here's the other one. Read the book. This is an excellent book. I wouldn't recommend it if it wasn't. In fact, I'll say this. I probably read larger portions. I probably read this book out loud to Anna more than any other book other than the Bible. It's just such a great book to these little blog-sized chapters, awesome stories. We laughed. We were provoked. Uh, this is just an excellent book. And I think you can get it at both of our cafes, Lyman and Henrietta, for 11 bucks. Don't go to a bookstore and spend 15 or 16 bucks. We've got tons of copies. We'll get more if we run out. Uh, go through the book. And then complete a balloon mission. Next week, things are going to get real interesting because uh, we're playing truth or dare as a congregation, except for there's no truth. It's all dare. <laughs> And so in the kids' ministry, student ministry, and adults, there's going to be balloons being handed out next Sunday to everybody who wants a balloon. And tied to the balloon is a mission where you get to do something and activate love at work or with your neighbor or, you know, buy a Starbucks for somebody or do something in the grocery store. And so we're going to be handing out all of these different secret missions, and and every balloon is going to have a mission attached to it, and we're going to give those out, and we want you to complete a mission. And then... The last one is stop by Next Steps to sign up for one of our love attacks. We've got the great pumpkin party coming. We have a whole bunch of leaf raking and treasure hunts happening uh, in the community. We've got Lima-specific and Henrietta-specific love attacks. And we would love for you just to get involved because this is what the Word of God says. Verse 12, no one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us. And his love is brought to full expression in us. Richard Nixon limped his way through a debate and lost. And we've got something so much more important than a presidential debate happening right now. This, is, this isn't about winning votes. This isn't about winning an argument or a debate. This is not about being elected. I, I, you know, voting is a big deal. And that's gonna, I'm going to do a whole series as we get up to the presidential election on that topic. But I'm less concerned about who people are going to vote for and more concerned about who they're going to worship. And when we express the love of God, people get to see, we get to make the desired one visible. And as we just begin to close at both campuses, I just want to say this. What would it look like? Like, what would it look like if in our homes, at work, we just, we just begin to say, Jesus, help me to be more engaged. Help me to be in the moment. Can't be there every second, but Lord, the first round, the last round, the last 15 seconds of each round. Help me to move for my interactions with people engaged. Help me not to always have to win. Help me not to treat conversations with my spouse or coworker like a thumb war. God, give me grace, right? Let me demonstrate your love in some way. And there's varying expenses. The Son of God, most expensive demonstration. Diamond ring, pretty expensive demonstration. 
Chicken pot pie? You decide. <laughs> you can demonstrate love in so many ways. You just can't think it. You've got to demonstrate it, right? I want you just to bow your heads all across the room. Here in Lima, Henry, I want you just to bow your heads. I want to pray together. Our mission is that every single one of us would experience Jesus' love and then give it away. And then experience his love and then give it away. Back to him in worship, to our kids, to our church, and the interactions we have with people. Experience his love and give it away. I want to ask you just as your head is bowed and your eyes are closed, Maybe you've been thinking about some missed opportunities that you've had recently and you feel guilty about it. Listen, shake off the guilt, shake off the condemnation. God's got a whole bunch of opportunities teed up for you over the next three, four weeks anyways. Don't, don't focus on the missed opportunities. But even right now, maybe, maybe you're sitting here in Lima or you're in Henrietta and, and a face is coming across your mind, a person I want you just to ask the Holy Spirit, how can I love that person in such a way to make Jesus visible? Lord, help me. You're unseen, but you said I could make you seen. How do I do that with this person? Maybe for some of you, it's just some aspects of the Love Does Challenge where you're saying, you know what, I'm I'm not going to just become, I'm going to risk something. I'm going to join a group. I'm going to be a part of a love attack. I want to do, I want love to be beyond theory, but God, I just, I need you to help me. If you'd say, you know what, I am a prime candidate. I need to experience the love of Jesus again, and I want courage to, to share it with other people, just raise your hand right now at either campus. Just, just between the Lord, just say, Jesus, this is, this is me. I need more of you. I want to do this. God, the, the, the devil may be trying to be like Mr. Wonderful saying, it's never going to work. You're crazy. It's never going to go out. Maybe the 12 disciples, but not you in your neighborhood, not you and your family. Lord, we just reject every lie right now. Holy Spirit, Spirit of the living God, thank you for making the love of Jesus just poured out, shed abroad in our hearts in this moment. I pray that you'd teach us to be more intentional. I pray it would become more natural, just like breathing, that our breath can become visible, that your love can become visible in our lives. I pray that you'd give us the grace to do it. I pray that you'd give individuals courage, all of us, God, myself included, in our interactions with people, that they would say, wow, I had an encounter with Jesus because I brushed shoulders with that person. I don't even know what it was, but it was, it was, it, we know it's the love of God. Jesus, thank you that there's more of your love to experience and there are more opportunities to give it away than we could ever imagine. Open our eyes, Holy Spirit. Reveal to us how we can partner with Jesus to see his kingdom extended. Make it real. Lord, thank you in advance for the opportunities this week and as the nerves and the jitters and, oh, do I do something? Lord, I thank you for courage and grace. Lord, we just want to express your love. We want to let it come out of the, the, the prisoner of our forehead so it's not just in our mind, God, but it's expressed in our lives. I thank you, Lord, for making that happen in individuals and families and as a church family for this region. In Jesus' name, amen.